most of what you know about the history of science and religion, with one exception here, uh, will be wrong, uh, probably, almost certainly. So, uh, the one overlap between my work on creationism and my uh, book here, Galileo Goes to Jail, is that among the 25 myths that I've identified here, the one that I chose to write about was that creationism has been and continues to be a distinctively American phenomenon. Now, one of the people uh, who was most uh, vocal in spreading this message was a hero, probably for most of us here, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, a uh, prominent paleontologist and fantastic science writer who was an active anti-creationist. And as he would travel around the world, people would ask him about, well, what's going on in America with this anti-evolution stuff? And he would assure his audiences that they need to have no worries about this because it was such a distinctive American bizarrity, his term, American bizarrity, that it could not travel abroad. Uh, and he and others often went on to say that even in the United States, that it was distinctive to the South. You know, rednecks. I grew up in Tennessee. Uh, you know, it comes naturally to me. Uh, well, he may have been right when he made these statements, although already the evidence was going against him. And since his death, uh, we have seen a massive exportation of creationism around the world, as I call it in one place. Uh, creationism has truly gone global. And mostly in the last 15 to 25 years. Let me just start out by giving you a few examples. If you want to discuss them, we can. Uh, if not, we can move on to what you want to talk about. I know you're here to talk and not to listen. Uh, I'm just the occasion for your getting together here. Uh, and it's nice to be able to have a drink on Sunday afternoon. Right? So, organized creationism or anti-evolutionism uh, began to spread about 1980 to places such as Australia, in a huge way to South Korea, and to other places. In fact, it became so uh, large a movement in South Korea that by uh, the turn of the millennium, they were sending creationist missionaries to the west coast of North America uh, because there were so many uh, expatriate Koreans uh, living out there. And also, soon after the turn of the century, uh, millennium, uh, began sending creationist missionaries to Muslim Indonesia to try to convert uh, those people to, to creationism. Australia became, uh, next to the United States, the biggest home uh, for creationism, especially strong in Queensland, sometimes known as the Texas of <laughs> Australia. Uh, you know, you just have to flip things. It's North Australia, but it's like the South, and everything's turned around down there. Yeah. Uh, and the biggest name in creationism internationally today is Ken Ham, who has moved over to the United States and set up his headquarters uh, just south of Cincinnati in northern Kentucky and recently opened, uh, a few years ago, a $27 million state-of-the-art creation museum where you can discover the truth about this. It has been so successful in attracting hundreds of thousands of visitors a year that some of you may have noticed that uh, they're now proposing uh, a $150 million 
dollar replica life size of Noah's Ark for which the state of Kentucky will provide uh, a big uh, subvention for this. It's creating a minor controversy in Kentucky, but they're used to things like this down there. So that Australian has become the true rock star of the creationist movement uh, uh, where, wherever he goes now and is getting by far the biggest, uh, the biggest audiences. Does he? Well, that's like that, that, a reason. He's been disallowed and, and that's the yeah, of people are being judged. so prejudicial. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a couple of major homeschooling conferences prefer the bio over people. Ah, okay. Uh, that's interesting. We can talk about biologos if you want to too. Uh, so, uh, a few more examples, uh, especially uh, ones that might be uh, counterintuitive. Uh, this movement uh, was confined for years, decades, to conservative Protestants, people we would tend to call fundamentalists, spread over into the Pentecostals and uh, some of the other conservative Protestant uh, movements. Uh, in, in recent years, there has been some uh, activity among conservative Catholics, uh, both in North America and in Europe. Uh, and the biggest surprises in recent years have been the explosive popularity of anti-evolutionism in the Islamic world and among uh, the ultra-Orthodox uh, Jews. Uh, some of you might not know that in two th the year 2000, uh, uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews in Israel and the United States uh, came together to form the Torah Science Foundation. Now, they go out of their way to stress that they are not like Christian fundamentalists. And the evidence for that is that they have mixed just a little bit of the Kabbalah in with their anti-evolutionism. And sometimes they call it kosher evolution, but it's the same as uh, young earth creationism in all of its major uh, parts. And they'll get a thousand or more people out to their annual conventions. The president of this organization is a biologist on the faculty of UCLA. So, uh, yeah, uh, these are smart people, I think. Uh, That's the problem. What? How does he keep his job? Seriously. Academic freedom? Sure. Don't you believe in academic freedom? Yeah, but there's that. Cuts both ways, you know. Texas, <laughs> though, teaching what? at gravity isn't real. I mean, you got to draw a line somewhere. Yeah, but he's probably not teaching creationism in his classroom. Um, what? Undoubtedly not, yes. Yeah. <laughs> what they'll do is they'll, they'll stick to, uh, you know, I'm sure it's obviously it's tougher in a university atmosphere, but I. You know, certainly in public schools, and to, to an extent, I'm sure the university professors that are sympathetic to creationism, what they do is, you know, they stick to the material, they teach what they're required to teach, um, you know, and whatever personal views they may have, huh, they, they, know, they know how not to uh, open themselves up to criticism, basically. Interesting. Okay. One of the most interesting uh, areas of expansion uh, that I have uh investigated has to do with the former Soviet Union. Uh, with the fall of the Iron Curtain, there was a big whooshing sound moving in uh, to, to Eastern Europe, and uh, the creationists were right on the edge of that movement. And it wasn't just their own initiative that brought them there. The new Ministry of Education in Russia, and in some of the other uh, East, uh, former Soviet countries too, uh, invited the creationists to come in and help them prepare textbooks and curricular materials uh, to be used in the public schools of, of Russia. And the rationale went like this. We have for decades been restricted to the dogma of Lysenkoism. Now we're free, 
And we don't want to substitute one dogma of Lysenkoism for a new dogma of Darwinism. We want to have freedom and choices. And so they have, as I say, invited uh, creationists who have been very happy to accommodate them uh, going in, in, that, in there. Uh, some resistance, interestingly, from the uh, Russian Orthodox Church, but there's been a little bit of backsliding there recently uh, because, after all, these people are fellow Christians and not materialists, uh, which, which was really uh, bad. So it reminds me a little bit about the story of the fox in the hen house, but so far I think most of the Russians haven't picked up uh, on, on that message yet. As I said, the, the most counterintuitive, perhaps, of all the developments in recent years has been uh, the popularity of uh, creationism in the Islamic world. And the roots of it go back, well, probably the roots of it go back to the, to the, 17th century, to the 7th century. Uh, but uh, by and large, uh, the Islamic communities did not pay much attention to, ev to evolution. Uh, and it was associated with the West, was associated with materialism, uh, Freemasonry, uh, terrible things like that. Uh, but then in the 70s and 80s, as creationism built up an institutional infrastructure in the United States, one of the big goals was to discover Noah's Ark because the flood for creation scientists was the most central event of all. Even It warranted much more uh, exploration than the creation itself, which was totally miraculous and, and left few traces. Uh, but the flood, they thought, could be investigated. You could see uh, where it was and its dramatic results. And so different groups of young earth creationists organized trips to discover the ark. Some of them did discover it, they claimed. Uh, <laughs> It's a little bit in dispute still, but um, they got acquainted with some of the people in, in uh, Turkey, where Ararat supposedly is. And then in the 80s, with a very conservative Turkish government, uh, their Ministry of Education invited American creationists uh, to come over, invited them to translate their books uh, especially the book Scientific Creationism, and that was an ideal book because that was one of the first ones that appeared in two different editions. One for public schools without talking about Christianity and one for Christian schools which had the traditional references in it. So they had this public school edition that wasn't promoting Christianity that could readily be translated and the Ministry of Education gave copies to every science teacher in, in Turkey. So there was a, a growing uh, movement uh, against evolution in Turkey. Of all the civilized nations in the world today, Turkey is the most opposed to evolution. And it's embarrassing to say, it's embarrassing to say the second most of the civilized nations is the United States. It's terrible to be second. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's where we are. Um, then uh, uh, in, in the 90s, uh, a charismatic former interior designer named Adnan Akhtar, who goes under the pen name Harun Yahya, started a movement. Uh, it's a strange movement. He not only opposes materialistic things, but materialism, the philosophy of materialism. He is like a, uh, an Islamic Mary Baker Eddy. He doesn't believe the material world exists. So, and he also hates evolution because it, it tends toward materialistic thinking in you know, Western style, style thinking. Um, he is, uh, 
He's like 15 years younger than I was. A few years ago, I was over there and was fortunate enough to spend an evening as his guest in his uh, villa on the Asian side of the Bosporus. Oh, yeah, you know, I was imagining that I was sitting on the sofa. You know, it didn't exist. And I took off my shoes so that I wouldn't soil his pure white imaginary carpet. Uh, anyway, uh, he has been uh, jailed uh, several times. He's been uh, diagnosed. Um, he has been accused of drug running and, and prostitution. Uh, all of which he says are just an attempt to bring him down. Uh, and of course, I have to accept his explanation for this, right? Uh, but he has built up a, a tight knit uh, group uh, called BAV, uh, Science Research Foundation. You probably could figure that out for yourself. Uh, BAV. And they produce hundreds of books under his pen name. And I asked him, I, when I was there, I think it was like 200 books or something like that. And I said, well, are you really the author of these? And uh, he said, uh, uh, oh, yeah. And I said, well, you know, I understand you have a team that works with you. Well, I have some assistance, yeah. But um, sounds like Elena Ceausescu was a prolific oh. writer of scientists. Uh, oh, uh, this guy seems fairly clever, although I'm sure he hasn't written 200 books. Uh, the best, I don't know if selling is the right word, the, the most widely distributed is probably a book called The Evolution Deceit. Uh, last I heard it was circulating about 8 million copies in dozens of translations. Uh, it's been printed on newsprint and given away with newspapers throughout Turkey. and this guy has been one of the first, if not the first, really to make use of the internet. And what was a marginal controversial movement 20 years ago in Turkey is now a truly international movement. Uh, Turkish friends of mine who laughed at my early interest and said, this is going nowhere, this isn't anything. Now tell me, wherever they travel around the world, one of the first things they're asked, well, what do, what do you think about Harun Yahya? And, and it's, um, if you wanted to, I could talk a little bit about uh, the flirtation with intelligent design uh, or even the relationship between creationism and intelligent design. But why don't I just stop right now and you've had a chance to figure out what you want to hear more about, what you want to talk about, uh, and let you ask some questions. Because if you wind me up on this, I can just keep going. Well, I guess the obvious question is, where does this end? I mean, uh, it seems like there are plenty of examples of, you know, politically motivated ignorance ending in disaster. Uh, you know, where where does this end? I'm just a humble historian. Uh, it's I. It's hard enough for me to understand the past. It's impossible for me to understand the future, although I am the son of a prophet. So I have some credentials here. Uh, my father was a fundamentalist preacher, as were both of my grandfathers. Yeah. I'm saved. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Just about true. Yes, indeed. Uh, Are you now part of a Oh, I think so. <laughs> oh my gosh, the allure of crea creationism, is it the belief that that's, people are, they have the answer, like they don't have to have any doubt, that they, they know the truth? Is that what the lure is? Well, I think for some people that definitely is. Most people don't want to live in a world of uncertainty where they have to decide for themselves. It's a tough world like that. Um, I, you, you guys, like me, are odd. Uh, uh, we like to think and make decisions, although I think many of you would admit it's not always the easiest thing. And so you get, you buy into these religions, and almost always creationism is associated with some type of, of religion, 
and you find answers to the big questions of life. Where did we come from? Where are we going? Etc. Um, also, there's a lot of, of suspicion of uh, scientific claims these days, even about uh, climate change and the evils of tobacco, and you could go on and on. Um, and sometimes it's been colleagues of mine in science studies who have prompted this, uh, looking at science as just socially constructed knowledge that, uh, you know, and I see a few scientists here, and they're probably just constructing it as they're sitting around. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but it does kind of take it off its pedestal a little bit. Uh, and then other people talk about how evil science is today, looking at some of the, the consequences. But it's, it, it varies from, from uh, group to group. Back to this gentleman's uh, comment here earlier. Uh, I don't want, I've already stepped on toes, but I'll continue to do that. I hope there are no uh, anthropologists or sociologists here. But uh, a few decades ago, those social scientists were assuring us that we could look forward to a totally secular future. It was just, some would say 50 years, some said 100 years. Secularization was an unstoppable movement in, in the world. Now, some of those same people, some of them have died, but some of those same people are saying, oh my God, uh, they're not saying that. Uh, <laughs> oh my, it's a bigger, yeah, shucks, right, you know. Uh, we have a bigger problem now explaining how robust religion is in the 21st century and mostly of a very conservative kind. The biggest religious story in the 20th century was the growth of Pentecostalism, which started out with one person on the first day in, in uh, Topeka, Kansas, which is part of the mythology, but it's a good thing. Um, and by the end of the 20th century, Pentecostals and their more generic brethren called charismatic Christians formed 27% of all Christians in the world. And these are not only Bible-believing Christians, but they're very supernaturalistic who believe in divine healing, in speaking in tongues, uh, etc. That's the most... Fundamentalism has, has uh, grown. You look at the, the growth. I mean, the poor Presbyterians and Methodists and uh, liberal Baptists have been shrinking. Um, and you look at the Islamic world. Uh, it's, it's very frequently the more conservative versions of Islam that have been prospering the most. So that came as a shock to most academics who studied religion. So will there be a reversal now when people say, oh, this wasn't such a good turn? Or will it continue to go more that, that direction? Yes? So do you think it's more a matter of Leon Festinger's uh, prophecy failing where these people, the more you show them that they're absolutely wrong, the more they go out and proselytize? Or do you think it's more the cash, follow the money, and there seems to be a limitless flow for... Uh, the support of stupidity and non-democratic forces? Uh, I tend to favor the former in a modified way. I have at one point tried to trace the money and uh, at least in the instances where I've looked uh, it hasn't been big. Uh, lots of small donations but not big ones. Now with this new museum and with the prospect of the Ark returning uh, uh, there seems to be more money flowing into this. Uh, certainly, Harun Yahya has been able to mobilize a fair amount of economic support for, for his movement. So it, it may well be, be changing, but um, I don't know if you are familiar with this notion from the 50s about how people adjust to uh, disappointments in their deeply held uh, beliefs. 
And it's really hard to disabuse a true believer of his or her, uh, his or her beliefs. Uh, and so they come up with all sorts of makeshift arrangements so that they don't have to give up what they may have sacrificed uh, a lot for. And um, Oh, to admit that they were wrong is harder yet, right. Um, I come out of the paradigmatic example of that, uh, the Millerite movement that for which, with which he starts that book, and uh, which gave rise to the Seventh-day Adventists, which you should be grateful, gave rise to scientific creationism. Uh, we take credit for that. And, uh, you know, here you have roughly 20 million believers now who still think that on October 22, 1844 something of cosmic significance happened. They were wrong that it was the end of the world, but they were right that Christ went from one compartment of the heavenly sanctuary to another one and started something they call the investigative judgment. So you cannot be a Seventh-day Adventist, as I've been repeatedly told, without believing that on October 22, this cosmic event occurred. I mean, you don't give it up. You just slightly revise it and push on with the, with the message. So. Do you see a place for investigation of this in the schools? In other words, where they have sure. discussions? Oh, yeah. Religious studies. I, I'm serious. I th it would be fine with me if they want to discuss it in, in, in religious studies courses. The holy grail for anti-evolutionists in America has been the public school classroom. And in the 20s, the strategy was to make it illegal to teach human evolution. Uh, yeah. And it wasn't until 18, 18, 1968 that the Supreme Court said that was unconstitutional. So immediately after that, there was an effort uh, to completely switch the, the, the debate uh, to claim that creationism was scientific and that it deserved to be taught in schools along. Okay, so in 1987, the Supreme Court said, you know, that's scarcely veiled religion, too. So that's un unconstitutional. And then we saw the rise, we've seen the rise of, of the intelligent design movement. And now the line is, let's teach the strengths and weaknesses of evolution. You know, as a historian of science, I don't see any problem with teaching the strengths and weaknesses of any scientific theory. It might be good pedagogy, except that I know the whole justification is to open the door, the legal door, to teach the weaknesses of, of evolution. And, and so um, I'm really opposed to that. But it's not on the face of it. it. On the face of it, it sounds religiously neutral. And given the composition of the Supreme Court today, five fairly devout Catholics out of nine, I'm not sure that a law uh, requiring the teaching of the strengths and weaknesses would fail. I just, I, I don't, of course, I don't know the future, but yeah. The average person, not even the, every person, doesn't understand everything that they use, how it works. They don't, I mean, I don't understand how my car works. I don't understand how my computer works, and I'm a technologist. <laughs> I agree with you. Uh, and I would extend your generalization to even most scientists cannot make a good case for evolution. And uh, Karen Steudel, uh my wife, uh, and I years ago, and I'll leave the department nameless, a, a, a strong scientific department on campus, met with uh, Bob Dot. Uh, one of the authorities on historical geology from the geology department, uh, 
with this department, mostly uh, graduate students, postdocs, and young professors, and tried to get them. We, we were role playing. We were a school board, and these people were trying to convince us why creation science should not be included in the curriculum. There wasn't a person there who could do it. Not a person. Um, either they got shot down by the geologist, the zoologist, or the historian uh, for, for some reason. And uh, I think this isn't all that uncommon. And I'll, I'll, I'll be even more personal about this. I li would like to think that education, if given a shot, would be successful. We know that a lot of high school teachers either ignore evolution or uh, just uh, don't believe in it. So it's not well taught in our secondary schools. Some of ours, yes, but not, not well taught. And even at the University of Wisconsin, we don't have a good general ed course on the evidence for, for evolution. I mean, there's one in anthropology, there's one in geology, kind of small scale courses. But the zoologists who whine all the time about people who believe in evolution won't get off their butts and teach a general head course on evolution. Not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> she just retired in May oh. as chair. Yeah. So, uh, but um, and very few in very few universities are there good general ed courses that bring together the evidence for your future citizens so that they'll know why. It's not just scientific authority. You know, I know John's one of the exceptions who really tries to teach evolution here, uh, and he's terrific at it. But by and large, I don't think we do a good job from here on. I think training graduate students were great, but by then, you're training a small group of specialists. You had a question. Yeah. Um, Moving over to a different school system, um, three or four years ago, uh, Sunlight Curriculum, so there was an O there, um, <laughs> Sunlight <laughs> Curriculum uh, was kicked out of the Colorado Homeschool Conference because they carried uh, Osborne books uh, that had a history of the universe in there that took a, a secular view, had an evolutionary view of life. They carried this, they didn't write it, they carried it as one of their curriculum materials and they were disallowed from that. It caused quite a firestorm in the homeschool community. Uh, if you want to go look it up on, on the Sunlight Curriculum blog, wonderful reading back and forth. It's a bunch of parents who really care about what their children learn and are investing a lot into it, and this caused them to debate back and forth. Um, just a week or two ago, I'm not sure the exact date, Ken Ham was disallowed from a, home, from a couple of major homeschool conferences. Um, so, and then, Next week, I believe you are going to be, and other people from the UW will be at Blackhawk Church here in Madison, speaking on science and faith and evolution and so on. Um, have you noticed any changes just in the last very short, you know, five, six, seven years of, in, in public perception of this, of pro-evolution arguments and so on? Public understanding, public perception? No. <laughs> I do sense a little more confusion I think that uh, a lot of people uh, have conflated scientific creationism and intelligent design. They know that they're both anti-evolution, but they're not quite, you know, uh, you know, they must be pretty much similar. They're not, uh, despite what the National Center for Science Education keeps telling us. Where are you? Uh, uh, so I see confusion there. I keep getting asked over the years by journalists, well, I guess in, intelligent design has the upper hand in the young earthers. I say, no. You, know, you guys are only interested in the latest controversy. There is no evidence that either one of them is shrinking. And then, of course, the museum opened, and people said, oh, I guess the young earth creationists now have gained the upper hand after Dover. Well. It's not quite that simple either. So, no, I don't see any major shifts taking place. Uh, s probably slight growth. Uh, 
but even the surveys that we have, both from the United States and from Europe, uh, don't ask the right questions. So that, uh, for example, the best survey question been asked since about 1980 by Gallup has been, do you believe that the first human beings appeared no more than 10,000 years ago as described in the Bible or something like that, very simple. And they've asked this almost every year, maybe every few years. Uh, and it's never varied below 44 and above 47 percent. But that doesn't tell us anything about old earth creationists who might believe that life has been here for millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, but believe that the first humans came along at the very end of that. So we, there, there's, there are no polls that I know of that really distinguish between old earth and young earth creationism or that distinguish between scientific creationism and intelligent design. Um, so we really don't know the relative strength and whether those are moving up and down. Uh, one poll a few years ago showed, uh, again by Gallup, but asking a different question, that 65.5% uh, of Americans either believe or lean toward creationism. Uh, you know, that's roughly two-thirds of your Americans. So there's a huge reservoir of public support for reasonable challenges to evolution. Which side of the line would you put the people who accept both? Who accept both God and evolution? Oh, I think I think they're in the I think they're in the other third. I'd put them with the evolutionists. I don't care if you're a theistic evolutionist or a materialistic evolutionist. I mean, the, the, the theistic evolutionists I know, uh, and uh, you know, there are people, there will be people at Black Hawk espousing this, uh, <clears throat> say, look, if we want to know how God created, we look to science and evolution. And, and that's how we found out how God did it. We don't take literal readings of Genesis to, to do it. So, uh, you know, they're fine. As for, you know, they're not, they're not any problem in terms of opposing evolution. In fact, they're helping to pave the way for conservatives to accept evolution. So I, I think that's great. Uh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting point because Philip Johnson, you know, is on record as saying, well, basically, his statements make it pretty clear that people like Ken Miller of Brown University, who's a very devout Catholic, but one of the foremost defenders of evolution, scare him a lot more than P.Z. Myers and Eugenie Scott and Jerry Coyne and all the outspoken atheistic defenders of evolution because for exactly that reason. Academics are just starting to grapple with it. Let me give you uh, an example of this. Uh, there have been polls since the 1910s of beliefs of scientists, etc., about God. Well, there was, there was a new result just published in a book called Science Versus Evolution by Elaine Eklund. Uh, she wrote it, uh, Oxford published it last year. She surveyed 1,600 uh, scientists at elite universities at a you know, maybe 20 elite universities, and yes, Wisconsin was one of them, so that was good. Uh, and found that 20-some uh, percent self-described as agnostics, 20-some percent self-described as atheists, uh, you know, close to half of, of scientists today. And it's been about 40 percent for 100 years, so slightly, slightly increasing. What I found that we had never really picked up before is that 20-some percent of the agnostics and atheists describe themselves as spiritual. Which, of course, leads to the question, what does it mean to be spiritual? And she was sophisticated enough a sociologist to ask them this. I think, I think it means you came down to the protests here around the square <laughs> yeah. in the last couple of weeks. Or you got together on Sunday afternoon to talk to your friends about science and religion, and it was an uplifting experience. <laughs> you know, for some of the people, it was that vague. 
You know, it was when they're out in nature, they feel this sense of awe or something, and they th describe that as spirit. I have uh, one other definition of what spiritual might mean. Though. I'm sorry, I can't see. Oh, oh one, yeah. One other definition. Um, they might be people who would like to believe in something if they could be convinced. Yeah. I think one generalization, and not so much from this study, but from other studies, that people who prefer to identify themselves as spiritual rather than religious don't like organized religion. You know, so you go all the way from pretty, pretty convinced theists to squishy people, <laughs> and you know who you are, uh, who kind of say, yeah, I'm spiritual. But they don't want to. They don't want to join a church. They will not join a church. You know that would be going off the the deep end somewhere. Can we get back to Miller. Why isn't he a theistic evolutionist? And what is well, what's the difference between being a Catholic? Well, you know this this is this is a very good question. It's something like what's the difference on the other side between a progressive creationist and a theistic evolutionist? My answer there is it depends on who the audience is. That evangelical Christians, if they're among fellow evangelicals, say I'm a progressive creationist. And if they're among more liberal types, they say I'm a theistic evolutionist. Uh, you know, you go, it gets back to the question. How many divine interruptions does it take to make a creationist? <laughs> the leading anti-evolutionist in America in the 1880s was Arnold Guillaume at Princeton. And he insisted on only three divine interventions for the creation of matter, the creation of life, and the creation of humans. And he was regarded publicly. He saw himself as an anti-evolutionist. He was regarded in public as the leading scientific anti-evolutionist in the United States. Uh, but there were, there were followers of Darwin who wanted more divine interventions than that. So you got this, this significant overlap. Um, I think the difference is, maybe, that, um, that Miller gives no role to God in this. Francis Collins and other theistic self-acknowledged theistic evolutionists will say, OK, this is God's way of of creating. And um, so it's kind of a, they, they won't use God to do anything. It's not a supernatural input at various points. Whereas I think, I think if I understand Miller, and I've tried, you know, even in conversation to get a good handle on this, is that he believes in God, he believes in Catholicism, he believes in evolution. And he thinks they're fine, but he's not going to say this is God's way of creation. So I mean, it's a, a little, it's not very different from theistic evolution, but he doesn't want to be called a theistic evolutionist. Okay. Got another question. I'm going to ask you to predict the future. What's next? <laughs> I already after asked him that. After, yeah. he wouldn't <laughs> do it. No, after the creationists have thrown evolution out, uh, I assume they don't like Oh, I know what's next. Okay. The apocalypse. <laughs> and no, no, I, I mean in the school system. Oh, in the school system. The reason I said that, many of the young earth creationists believe in the imminent end of the world, and they're not creationists just for the heck of being creationists. They are creationists because they want, especially Christians, to accept Revelation and Genesis as God's literal inspired word. And they're motivated by the certainty in their minds of the end of the world. And so these, for many of these creationists, those two things are, are integral. Uh, but your question is, what happens in the schools? Yeah, I mean, th there are lots of other scientific uh, departments which have random yeah, yeah, yeah. Are they going to go after physics? It strikes me as being a rather tough nut to crack in physics. Well, they already have. Uh, how, how did it work out for 
Uh, it got overturned. Uh, okay, so it, just a few years ago in Kansas, when the conservatives gained control of the State Board of Education, they went after three scientific teachings. Evolution, geological ages, and Big Bang physics. Uh, as contrary. Those were, and then they also wanted to accept, this was from the influence of intelligent design, supernatural causation as, as legitimate science. So there were kind of four things, but, but three scientific theories that they wanted uh, not to be taught as, as, as truth. Uh, so they, that got overturned. We haven't seen that, that implemented. Uh, let me tell you what scares me a little bit that's a little backdoor answer to your, to your question. Uh, according to uh, interpretations of the U.S. Constitution now that prevail from the Supreme Court, public schools in America are supposed to be religiously neutral, right? <clears throat> Sounds like a good thing. Except the fundamentalists have been telling us for years that evolution is atheistic. It is not neutral. And in recent years, the new atheists have been saying the same damn thing. Evolution is inherently atheistic. What if those two groups should convince the Supreme Court? What would that do to the teaching of evolution in our country? You know, most of the time I think, well, that's far-fetched, and then other days, I think maybe it's not so far-fetched. Uh, so, but that's that's the stated goal in the country that that sci that education, including science, will be religiously neutral. So, I don't know what will happen. Even if you could uh, teach the weaknesses of evolution, you still better be careful about not promoting a particular religious dogma. So, or non-religious dogma. Or non. Oh, right. And, or non-religious. You're right. You you're right. Mean is secular. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And secular has been turned into atheism by some people. And you mentioned spiritual. That's a backdoor way of saying, oh, we're not. I, I'm always working against the twelve-step people. I mean, nothing against them. They can, if it works for you, fine. But they, it's such a knee-jerk thing that you say, but, you know, for people, and the evidence is overwhelming, for people who don't believe, you know, this is nonsense right. that, you know, a causal agent is going to come away and take away your uh, defects of character. Oh, but we're not being religious, we're just spiritual. And the confusion over, are we talking about school spirit, the spirit of the nation, or are we talking about a little spirit that comes down and takes away your character defects? And just a reminder... In the United States, and maybe the United States alone, the body that decides what is science and what is not science, what is medicine and what is not medicine, is our court system. It's not the AAAS or the National Academy or the professors at the University of Wisconsin. That's where the ultimate decision is made. And so it's, it's an interesting arrangement we don't have a ministry of education or science to, you know, come down and say, this is what we're going to teach, this is what we're not going to teach. So it's, a, it's, it's worked well for us, but it's a little iffy in some respects. Uh, don't they rule that science is what scientists do? And all you need to do is look at what most scientists do. To what, I mean, that's the, what the courts basically rule. I don't think so. No? No. No. I might well. Okay. Well, I don't know if you covered this. Sorry, I had to go down. Um, Dover did, you are saying about, you know, the effects of Dover, um, it, it has squelched um, a lot of specific efforts in local school boards and some legislative efforts a little bit. Maybe that, maybe that chilling effect on anti-evolutionism in um, school districts and the legislation is going to wane now. Obviously, there's plenty of efforts now, but it certainly did because... Um, you know, the pro-evolution side just really thought they had a grand, well, they did, they got a grand slam um, when the judge did rule that intelligent design was not science and was a religion. That really went beyond their initial hopes for the case. Oh, 
I agree. That was a sign of divine providence right there. <laughs> to get Judge Jones. Uh, Yeah, I don't know. Did they ever pay their fines? I don't know. Because they should have. There was a hand up over here a minute or two ago, maybe. Yeah? Well, I have a question about, since you brought up chilling effect, and this is kind of, well, unrelated except to the point of almost all professors in this state. Um, do, are you concerned that we're going to see some kind of, uh, you know, right-wing and religious conservative policy of starting to harass professors like not in Professor not in Wisconsin you don't think that'll happen <laughs> well it, you're, you're optimistic it won't happen it'll no happen. I'm right now very pessimistic I hate to see what just happened to Cronin um, you know and 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 I'm concerned even about uh, you know it'd be great to have more freedom for Madison uh, by breaking away from the current arrangement, but when you have the governor appointing a majority for three-year terms, you know, quick turnover in the regions, high politicization of the governing body, boy, I, you know, <laughs> I'm a little bit skittish about this. It might turn out to be great you know, like the UW Hospital. But there's nothing really controversial going on there, uh, except maybe abortion. Yeah, there were late-term abortions yeah. well, at the UW Hospital. Yeah, but, but by and large, I mean, there's so many targets at UW-Madison that you could go after. All these godless evolutionists, you know, get rid of them. You know. uh, so I, you know, we're going through troubled times where things are changing rapidly in front of us, and uh, I, I don't pretend to know what's, what's going to be our answer here. But I am concerned. I think that intrusion uh, uh, is likely to increase. Both sides are getting more political, you know, I think. Yes? You said that for decades the proportion of the population that believes in creationism has hovered between 44 and 47 percent. That believes that the first humans were created no more than 10,000 years ago. Uh, is that just a, a matter of social inertia? If you're, you're raised in that kind of household, you're inclined to believe in it. If you're not, you don't. And, and the, that percentage of the population just remained relatively stagnant through the years. Is, is, is that the primary cause for it? Or is there actually some shifting back and forth across the demarcation line where you got people that are going out evangelizing and then you get the educational component that yeah. says you know, that's bringing people over the other way. Does, does it slosh back and forth or is it just pretty much pipeline? Well, I've spent more years than any sane person should trying to figure that one out. <laughs> uh, and just when I think I get a handle on it, it slips away from me. Um, there is some change. Uh, although a roughly a quarter of college graduates in America fall among the creationists. So there is a skewing. The more education you have, the more likely you are to become an evolutionist. There's some skewing uh, with, with race. African Americans are more inclined to reject evolution. Uh, and so we have some of those you know, demographic factors that, that, that we're aware of, but it does seem to be fairly, fairly constant over 30 years now since that uh, question uh, has, has been asked. My sense is that probably the, uh, that although you have a lot more education, you have in the 20th century this explosive growth of Pentecostals, of many pro, uh, fundamentalist groups, et cetera, et cetera, that they, you know, recede, uh, not recede from, but that they they fill the ranks of the of the anti-evolutionists. Uh, there's been uh, a huge well, if you just read the the census report, huge explosive growth of Hispanic Americans just in the last decade. Many of those are Pentecostals. 
uh, who have left Catholicism, uh, and even some, you know, the conservative Catholics are, are creationists. I mean, that's going to provide another reservoir of uh, large numbers of, of creationists here. Uh, so it's, a, it's an ever-changing situation that keeps the statistics fairly, fairly constant. Richard? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, uh, from what I've seen, I wish I could remember the poll that I saw, but there was a um, some numbers that I saw that basically said if you're 50 and older, you are more likely to be swayed by the current neo-creationist arguments that are coming out there and the and shift creationists. But if you are 35 and younger you are more likely to be an evolutionist and be more secular. And that means that for the long term, things may skew in, yeah, I think I can safely call the people in this room on our side, in our favor, <laughs> okay? And uh, that uh, time will be on our side on that one. Um, but you're right about the influx of, uh, of, of Latin Americans that, uh, has really shifted the demographic somewhat. Uh, I don't know which direction that's going to go either. But I well, right now it's not going liberal. <laughs> I, I did see a, a poll that showed that, uh, that young people definitely skew more towards the side of evolution than creation. But then when they become older, then they go back? Because they would well, then I mean, be part of it is backfired. I mean, good grief. You look at what they're trying to do to indoctrinate children these days. You got things like Bible man. Okay, they hit their teenage years, they look back and they say, oh, that was so dumb. <laughs> and they were right. But then why are his friends, the sociologists, who 20 years ago predicted secularity for us all, why are they backtracking? Why are they wrong? Because the evidence. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you do a survey and you see all this religiosity bubbling up all over the place, not just in the United States, but... Uh, uh, around the world, and not just in Christianity. Conservative religion across the board seems to be flourishing right now. Whether it's a temporary blip, who knows? But it's, it's, you know, it's certainly not the linear decrease of religiosity that was predicted with confidence a few decades ago. Can I, can I make a global statement? Yeah. Very global. <laughs> Sitting here listening to this, I'm, I'm the discussion and conceptualizing some thoughts in my head. I'm wondering if we have a, well, it's the polarization of our society. They're going, they're going extreme, that's my observation. I agree. Either end, nothing in the middle, either end. Those people who know how to think are evolutionists <laughs> <laughs> and are a religious. Those people who do not want to think go more towards the religiosity, which is everything's going to be given to me. It's a polarization. That's uh, a global statement, I realize that. But I, I, it, it just this, this gentleman over here said a number of minutes ago, we, it, it would be a mistake to describe these people as dumb. I didn't say that. No, I'm saying well, that I'm he said that. To think. These, these are people yeah. being part of the uh, Christian homeschooling community. Yeah. These are people who are, are very heavily invested in thinking very hard about what they're teaching. Let me give you one statistic to just roll around in your head. So the Creation, uh, uh, Creation Research Society, the leading creation science organization, was formed in 1963. Ten initial founders. Five of those founders had earned PhDs in biology from major universities. A sixth had a PhD from Berkeley in biochemistry. You know, a seventh had a PhD in hydraulic engineering from Minnesota. I mean, these were not dumb people. I mean, they may have been wrong, but they weren't dumb. The exception that you're making there to what I'm saying is I'm not talking about education. Okay. Take away education. Okay. I'm taking away the ability to take both sides and conceptualize their own concept, to think. Yeah. Not dumb, not uneducated. I, I, see, I see what you're thinking, but I see, I, I see what you're saying, but I, I would disagree on one point that I think is important to understand. 
Um, I, you know, I, I studied uh, creationism professionally at the National Center for Science Education, worked with it on the ground. Um, I'm the only person, I think, in the world that can say that they listened to Kent Hovind for nine hours within a 27-hour period. I've been to dozens of... But you can't claim to be sane, then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, and, and I say he's the only non-religious... Yeah. <laughs> I, I used to, I mean, I've, I've been to dozens of creationist, you know, events and, and talked to the people. And I think the one, one of the real dynamics you, you can see at work is the leaders of the organization, Ken Ham, the people at ICR that you mentioned, the pro, what we call the professional creationists, for whatever reason are convinced themselves that the only way to maintain their own personal salvation, you know, whatever that means, rejecting evolution is a big component of that. In order to convince, you know, the masses or to evangelize, you know, the Great Commission, right? Mm -hmm. The only way to maintain their Great Commission is to convince their followers that they too have to reject evolution if they want their souls to be saved. If you go out on the square, every farmer's market out here, you'll see, uh, what's his name, Kevin, and now his buddy Larry shows up with him. You can't talk to them about evolution and creationism for more than a minute before it eventually turns around to what's going to happen to you when you die. And Kevin has even told me that, it, this is basically a direct quote verbatim, he really doesn't care very much about this evolution and creationism stuff. What's important to him, he says, is the Bible and saving souls. So you can't say you, they're not thinking, but what they've been convinced in a very systematic way by organizations like the ICR and AIG is the whole foundation of Christianity and their personal salvation, um, a very large component of that is, is rejecting evolution. Yeah, that's what I was saying a few minutes ago. Eschatology is crucial to understand the the success of these anti-evolution move of many of these anti-evolution movements. Do they think of themselves as rejecting science as well as evolution? Or well, evolution? that's a point that I wanted to make. Actually, that I thought of earlier. I think it's important for you know those of us that call ourselves pro-evolution. Really, I think what you what a more accurate statement is you're pro-science because they don't just rec reject evolution; they reject. Basically, all of the fundamental principles of astronomy, geology, um, you know, physics. Think about the fact that if you're going to cram the entire history of the universe into 6,000 years, what that means to radioactivity. That means that, you know, they claim that these, uh, I don't want to get too detailed and they get too much time on this, but, but you know, um, radioactive decay, what, they, what they'll propose in general, and you read this in the websites and stuff, is that all your radioactivity, the, the rates of radioactive decay used to be much, much higher. And then any physicist will tell you that if you want to cram that much radioactive decay into 6,000 years, all of a sudden the Earth just becomes a burned cinder. Because now you've got ridiculous amounts of radiation. So it's important to, I think, it's, uh, to, to read, just to make sure, it's important to understand that they're not just rejecting evolution. They're really rejecting virtually all of science. Is, but what do, not necessarily the professional creation but the people who are their audience and learning from them, do they present themselves as being anti -science? I can answer no. that. Oh. I can answer that question. And there's been a huge shift, and then I know Peter wants to say something. Because the creation, the anti-evolutionists have changed significantly on this. During the 20s, uh, Scopes trial and all that, uh, the uh, ploy there was to argue that evolution was so hypothetical and speculative that it did not deserve the good name of science. Okay? None of these people saw themselves, or almost none of these people saw themselves as anti-scientific. Now what happened in, say, the 60s on is that they completely flipped their argument and said creationism is scientific and it deserves to be included in this. It's very rare, and I assume you found this too, to find anti-evolutionists who are anti, who see themselves as anti-scientific. Yeah. They love science, uh, and either they want to be in it in the recent decades, or they want to exclude evolution as they did during, say, the first half of the 20th century. So uh, self-image will find you very few uh, anti -scientific. Peter. Well, I was contemplating what may happen with uh, education with the rise of conservative pressure on schools and all the talk about Catholics and now the use of science. 
I, I wanted to know for a long time what you know or what you may have heard about the geocentricity conference at Notre Dame. Uh, oh. I mean, <laughs> these, these are Bible motivated I wanted smart to go people. to that. Right? And, uh, yeah. and Catholic. I have been unable to find out much about what... No, I... I've, I what, okay, a few months ago, uh, an announcement appeared. Uh, obviously, Peter and I got it. Maybe you sent it to me. I don't know. Uh, that uh, Notre Dame, not University of Notre Dame, Notre Dame was hosting uh, a geocentric conference of Catholic geocentrists, and a lot of them had higher degrees here. Just make sure everybody understands geocentrism was oh, earth at the center of the... Well, it rejects Copernicanism, which was a nice idea back in the uh, 16th century. Uh, Wait, I, I have a question about geocentrism. Yeah? Um, do they not just... Okay, so they obviously believe that everything revolves around the Earth, but does that include other galaxies? Everything in this galaxy? I mean, how far did they Actually, take go it? Actually, GalileoWasWrong.org has a list of the people who... <laughs> That's this group. That's this group, Galileo.org. Actually, there, um, one, one, of the, one, of the, one of the guys out there who, who like, uh, 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 some of us like to go to these things, actually did go, and he's got a real good account out there. I know if you Google that conference, you can dig it up. I don't remember his wow. name or anything. Um, but there is a real good uh, account of the conference out there. I mean, one of the, the things that that did to me is that for a long time I've generalized in print and orally that if you see a geocentrist, you can be certain that that person was, was or is a Missouri Synod Lutheran. And uh, into the early 20th century, the Missouri Lutherans were characterized by other Lutherans as the geocentric Lutherans. I mean, they were ridiculed. What? Yeah. You know, they were. Um, and so, like the Bible Science Newsletter, uh, a creationist publication, uh, the editor was a geocentrist and provided a platform uh, for, for geocentrism. Uh, and so this really caught me by surprise that now you have an organized group of Catholics uh, that are geocentrists. Uh, maybe the Lutherans and Catholics are forming an ecumenical <laughs> geocentrist movement. I don't know. Yes? Do you think it might be that people just don't have a very good understanding of how science works and the processes and the statistics involved? Like, the, I feel like... I'm not sure how science works either. But I mean, as far as like, the process of doing research and like, um, you know, statistical methods and things like that, because if you're... I mean, there's statistics to back these things up, whereas for creation, there's not statistics to back it up. Well, no, because they, they will say, oh, no, we've got plenty of science, we have plenty of statistics. It really boils down to existentialism. What's going to happen to me after I die? You know, it really does. Once you, when you immerse yourself into it and study it on that, on that level, because, you know, guys, you know, you know, guys like these, Younger creationists and answers in Genesis. If they were here, they could argue their point strongly enough and with and coached in enough technical lingo that probably very few people in this room. I mentioned we may have some science majors and things. We'd have a hard time really refuting them. We could certainly fall back on say, well, you know what? Why don't you publish in Nature? How come you don't? How come? How, why does the scientific community reject you? Well, we have John Hawks can certainly take a part. I, I will tell. I will tell everybody this on the subject of whether they're smart or dumb and this sort of thing. There are people who cite who people who work in human genetics. You know, there are scientific creationists who who work on human genetics, mm -hmm. cite serious papers in human genetics, who are better critical thinkers in the subject of human genetics than my graduate students are. And I would not put any of my students up against them mm -hmm. in terms of an argument like that because my students would lose. And I would like to go into partnership with you, if you can disprove geocentrism. Because uh, I've been offered uh, on occasion $10,000 to disprove geocentrism, and I can't do it, but maybe the two of us together could split it, and it's not as easy as you think. <laughs> Center. 
And at the end, he says, whenever you come across one of these people, don't argue with them. They'll <laughs> beat you into the ground. This is what they do. You have a life. You, you do things. They don't. They think about this all the time. They've heard all of the arguments. They have reputations. The reputations are wrong, but you won't be able to uh, deflate them off the top of your head. Stay away. What a lot of people don't know is that Martin Gardner, as a youth, was a fervent young earth creationist. He mastered all the evidence for it, and he knows what he's talking about. There's, yeah. um, has there been any revival in flat earthism, and which, um, which, which faith were those people from? I don't know. There's a, a, a good book that came out about two years ago by a British historian of science called Flat Earth uh, that tracks these people. Uh, it, was a, a, it erupted as kind of a major debate in the 19th century. Uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, the co-discoverer of natural selection, became very active in, the, in, in opposing flat earthism and taking up challenges to, to disprove this. And she continues into the 20th century. It's a very fringy, well, maybe all these groups are kind of fringy, but numerically fringy. Uh, but not without some support. So, but that's the latest. Uh, oh, I should tell you, the, the authority in the United States on flat earthism uh, was a science educator, former head of the National Center for Science Education, science journalist from Minneapolis, what's his name, begins with S, died suddenly a few years back. Shadowwald? Shadowwald, yeah. And we, Memorial Library and Special Collections, has his collection of flat earth material, making us the number one research center for flat earthism. Oh and, and a few years ago, I turned over all my creationist library to them. So it's one of the best creationist libraries, too. So if you have any goofy ideas, give them to the library here. They, they want them. Yeah. Yes? I'm just thinking about the evolutionary part. Just like. You know, so many Americans have to believe in American exceptionalism, and you're criticized if you say we're not perfect. The um, reluctance to believe in evolution, isn't it kind of vain? It's almost, you know, it's like people have to believe that there couldn't be anything before what we look like now. You know, how could you have been an ape or something? Like, it's van in a way, it's, isn't it kind of vanity? Well, uh, there, there, I think for some people, and, and there are expressions of this, we were created, how would you want us to give up belief that we were created perfectly in the image of God for this ape-like stuff uh, uh, that, hasn't, that hasn't been the dominant theme? But in deep in people's, not maybe spoken, but just, you know, emotional feeling of not being able to... Well, it's not a good feeling. You like to think you come from an ape? Well, I don't think about it, but it doesn't I mean, matter. Like but it's like, it's like hey, it's at least thing. five generations back. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> oh, oh. Right? Five generations back. If, 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 if I knew my grandfather, I knew it's only two generations. Right? Like, in, you know, did you come from an ape? Well, your uncle may have been a... <laughs> not, hey, hey, read, read, Galileo goes to jail. That's a myth. If you'll give it away for a door prize, I can guarantee you at least one person. Will yeah. <laughs> is it possible, though, that part of this is not the argument, you know, did evolution occur or not, but uh, if you go with evolution, then you're going with an atheistic belief system. Yeah. Well, that's a secular, I'd say, but they call it atheism, and atheism isn't very popular. Matter of fact, uh, as a historian, I'm wondering... When did it even become legal to be an atheist? I mean, get the vote, get the right to testify in court. Each country, you know, I mean, oh, we'll let the Catholics go, we'll let the Jews go. Atheists, John Locke, who I think was a thinking person, wouldn't let atheists have a say in court because without an oath, to, uh, without a belief in a supreme being, then you're not going to be punished. Yeah. You can lie your ass off. Like yeah. Well, right. actually, b before before we leave the the idea, oh, you know, before we leave the notion of or what she brought up about, 
you know, being, being descended from, from ape-like creatures. One thing that's just interesting to think about is, you know, with, any, with the big professional creationist organizations, you'll certainly fl- find a, a wide range of their staff having advanced degrees in, you know, genetics and a few geologists here and there, although not many. But one, uh, one thing I've never come across is a creationist primatologist. And, John, do you know of any creationist anthropologist? Sure, <laughs> but they're all cultural anthropologists. They're not physical anthropologists. Yeah, say. Not a physical but think about a crea- there, are, there are creationist archaeologists. There definitely, yeah, yeah, there, there are. Think about what a creationist primatologist would have to do. They'd have to get up there close to a chimp and then go, no way, dude, I'm not related to you. And the chimp would probably give him the finger. <laughs> well, that'd be embarrassing. Yeah, that's... So can I uh, offer something that's yeah, kind of back to what you were saying? Um, you know, I think a lot of this conversation has showed us um, that we really are in a dilemma that you alluded to earlier. I just realized that. And that is that um, I don't have any problem on a theoretical basis with us teaching uh, creation sciences, science, or intelligent design as science because we can show how easily it doesn't stack up to science. You know, it doesn't hold water as a scientific theory. So teach it in science classes. But what you were saying before has me more troubled, and that is about how we're actually educating people in this country, both people who are not becoming teachers, and especially those who are becoming teachers, and in particular science teachers, and whether they have a real understanding of how to teach science properly. And so my prediction about the future is um, that if you want the future to be a certain way, you've got a much better chance of getting close to it if you're actually out there trying to work for it. So if you think that's important of how we're teaching our, our uh, students and our future science teachers, and if you're in that business and in that field and you have any way to influence it for the future, think about what kind of an impact you can have and whether you can help make the future a little more the way we would like to see it rather than the way we're afraid that it might turn out. Let me ask you a question. So we've had professional science educators, not just scientists, but science educators for probably about 100 years now. Uh, Recent polls suggest that we're slipping down fast in science and math education uh, compared to countries around the world. What's wrong with science education? I mean, in America, that we are not doing a better job given all the experts who specialize in this uh, it, it is a puzzle to me. I would think that we would be doing much better. In K-12, me, That's what I'm talking about, K-12, K-12, right? How many people who teach science actually have a strong science background? <laughs> or is a coaching a better background? In the South where I grew up, coaching was a, was a prerequisite to teaching history and yeah. some science, yeah. We also have to, you know, before we start blasting the teachers, think about how many students actually get through high school basically no science education. Right. In fact, I read a few years ago when, um, you know, statistics started to show um, a significant number of school districts around the country allowed students to graduate from high school without a single science class. So before we bash the teachers or talk about what these people are doing wrong, just think about how many students were actually requiring to take science in the first place. As a teacher, I wouldn't bash teachers. It was just a simple, innocent question I was asking. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just thought There's, what it seems to me is, are you looking at the top part of our educational system and our better students? I've taken advanced science courses with undergraduates at UW, and they're pretty damn hard. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Now, if you want to go down to the average Joe Schmo who graduates from a, a co- uh, from a high school in rural Texas. Well, that's what I was thinking of K-12, K science education, and that we don't seem to have gotten the hang of what we need to do effectively to teach that. You had a question. It was actually more an observation. I used to work for many years for the State Department of Public Instruction where we paid attention to how things, what got taught and how things got taught, and the uh, ability of education to the educational system to address this sort of thing is 
in many ways captive to the structure that we've set up, whereby we're more interested in the early years of socialization than we are in, in the uh, advancement of knowledge. Um, that's why your leading predictor of what a kid's going to be exposed to throughout the school system has nothing to do with their their interests, their uh, background, their, their strengths of knowledge, their family upbringing, um, educational, uh, mother's educational level is very frequently seen as a predictor of how well you're going to turn out to, in, in terms of your own knowledge. Uh, we don't pay much attention to any of those factors. The leading in, uh, predictor of what you're going to be exposed to in the school system is what's your birthday, because it's so much more important that you be grouped together with other people of the same age, that kids that are really bright at science, you know, that's too bad. You know, you, you could be taking, you know, fifth grade courses in science when you're in third grade. We don't care. You're in third grade. That's the sort of uh, stuff you get exposed to. And the fact of the matter is that the elementary school teachers in this country are generalists. They are not specialists in education and due to the way our system has evolved, they tend much more heavily to be women who have been, you know, historically discouraged from paying any attention to the sciences. Fortunately, that's turning around, uh, but but historically, the, the elementary education that you get in this country is being provided by people who do not have a, uh, a gut level feel for how science works. And that's the level at which most people either get turned on to science or turned off from science. And I regret to say that in the vast majority of cases, they're being presented with, with the attitude toward science that it's this big, mysterious, spooky thing that only very few people get into and they tend to be geeks and, and, you know, and, and they don't fit in well. This starts turning around when you get to uh, middle school, junior high, when you start specializing, you get people who uh, teach science who got into it because they like science. But at that point, they all become elective subjects. It's not something that you're generally exposed to. You have to voluntarily sign up for it, which means that if you've never been exposed to somebody who really likes science, you're less likely to sign up for it voluntarily. And so we do have a science requirement in the uh, state curricular standards saying you have to be exposed to a certain amount of science before you can walk out of high school with your piece of paper. And so you get some, whether you want it to, want it to or not. But it's not something that uh, we as a society tend to value. We, we're much more happy about sports teams and rock bands. Uh, so science, science education at the elementary level is pathetic, and it only gets a little bit better, but it gets more specialized as you get older. The real problem I see with the um, process of introducing critical thinking to kids is that Developmentally speaking, they're not really ready for it until they're uh, up to the upper levels of high school. So this, this uh, constant refrain you hear from the intelligent design people is, let's teach the controversy. It's a terrible thing to do to a middle school kid, mm -hmm. is to try and teach the controversy. They're barely able to handle you know, the basic understanding, let alone the, the philosophy and, and the alternatives. Uh, teaching the, the controversy is a great thing for a class in philosophy of science or history of science, you know, presented to someone who's developmentally ready for it. But it's an awful thing to do to, to a kid who's just having trouble grasping the very basics of what happens when you drop a rock. So uh, education's been wrestling with this for a long, long time. And, and does, I, I guarantee you at the K-12 level, they do not have the answers, and they're still groping trying to figure out how, to, how best to deal with it. It's, it's Perhaps a little better when you get up to the university level. I don't know, but it, you tend to get much more self-selection at that point, and I'm not sure that the average university student is uh, is in any better shape than the average middle school student. Anyway, sorry. No, I. Uh, yeah. You know what, though? Can I? Oh, I just want to say what you said, though. If I understood you right, about if the kids are too young to question, is that what you were saying? To like. Critically yeah, you, think you don't about deal it. Well, with ambiguity, if you're a middle school student. No, but if you think about it, mo any of us that were raised in, with a religion in our family, you know, that's the whole thing. Is from when you're Catholic, baptized, I'm indoctrinated, and I happen to be in a family where my father was a reluctant Catholic. So from the youngest ages, we were always like being questioned about it, and that's how I got in trouble with the priest when I asked if he would. I think I was in seventh grade. I wanted to know. 
donation I thought meant voluntary, so why wouldn't he say a mass for my grandmother without my two dollars? Because then wasn't he selling the mass to me? <laughs> and he wouldn't like agree with me. So my point dollars. was I think I think in a way kids should be challenged younger, not not like undo their religion from what they're being taught at home, but questioned why do you believe or because I would have liked comparative religions. I've had to study it on my own. Like I just recently heard about the Millerites. I didn't, and I never heard of the Missouri Synod, Synod lot until he mentioned it, and then you repeated it. So I kind of disagree with you that I think kids should be, they are inquisitive, and what's that two year olds are always, why, 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 why? So anyway, that's, sorry, I embarrassed you. Your two I'm perspectives <laughs> kind of match up in that you're putting the social groups together yeah. as the main thing that counts here for, or in the classroom level. Yeah, like I'd be curious you why you homeschool. Yeah. Yeah, and, and um, yeah, I think if I ask people here, when did you get turned on to science and who turned you on to science, probably, I'm going to guess, uh, or I'll shoot myself in the foot. <laughs> uh, most of you would say, well, my fam rarely a teacher, right. mostly a fam, you know, it was a family culture kind of thing. Our family did this. You know. Yeah. Um, that's sort of how literacy works. Um, let me ask you another question. How many of you in this room spend an hour every single week with evangelical Christians or charismatics or fundamentalists no way. in a no in a close in a in a close friendly relationship? They don't like you. And what does that say about how people like can know and understand what where they're coming from? No, well, I just want to say I have a I'm from Connecticut, and I guess when I was 14, 13, going cross country, I met a girl camping from Wisconsin who was born born again. So as I moved away from being religious, she's more religious. And our joke was always, we, we were the only ones like us that we knew. Because I don't hang around with people like her, and she doesn't try to not hang around with people <laughs> like me. But the interesting thing is our values were the same. She just comes with it from God. So when we pulled up to visit one year, she had like how many babies were killed by abortion bumper sticker and I had a pro-Clinton one, but we had a nice visit. So I, I think, like you're saying, I think we do need to interact more with other people, but it's kind of hard because people want to hang out with people like them usually, you, right? You have to make an effort, so. See, I, that's why I knitted, I would have talked more, see? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for knitting. No, I <laughs> Um, we have all these education things, right? Yeah. I want to teach you more and better information about evolution, yeah. right? Yeah. But I'm doing this in a in a group that is not really my social group, right? You go home, you go to church mm -hmm. on Sunday, you go to wherever it is, you, you play around. Your social group may not share this goal of teaching you more and better information about evolution. And yet there's a lot of effort put into doing that kind of science education. So are we dealing with the fact that... I'm, I'm still not sure I'm going to be right on target here, but I do have one principle that I, I stick to, and uh, pedagogically here. I think that you do not typically succeed by challenging deeply held beliefs. I think as soon as you do that, the defenses go up. You know, they've been warned that godless professors will try to teach them stuff and that you have to be much kinder, uh, subtler perhaps, in, in, a, in approaching students. Uh, and uh, so I, and I don't have any statistics to back that up. I do have some, some you know, personal examples. Uh, and I know my own experience that uh, coming out, uh, I went from fundamentalist schools to Berkeley. And I was ready for those atheists. <laughs> uh, none of them ever attacked me, which was wonderful. Uh, and so uh, I never had any, any guys at, at Berkeley uh, attack my beliefs. Of course, I was, I was fairly quiet about what I really believed then. But I was ready if they had done it. Um, 
And what they did teach me that was invaluable was to read and think critically and not just accept on the basis of authority. That was truly revolutionary for me. So um, that's what I think is important.